I'd like to address the subject of baptism. We're going to look at the passage that was read for us just a moment ago. Uh, we'll look at that passage during our study. We'll look at a number of other passages as well. But we're going to consider the, sub the question, what is baptism? I heard a denominational preacher say many years ago in, in introducing a, a sermon on baptism, a sermon in which I found very little to agree with, uh, but I did agree with his opening statement. He said, if you want to upset some people, start challenging the validity of their baptism. And that is true. If you get into a religious discussion with someone and the subject of baptism comes up and they share their experience with you and you begin to question that, you're likely going to get a very strong response from them. There is no question that water baptism is essential for our salvation. This is a very controversial subject, but it is settled very plainly if you'll look honestly at the Bible. Let me mention a few scriptures for you. Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus, our own Lord, said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. In Acts 2, 38, when the Jews there heard the gospel and they were cut to the heart, they were convicted of their sin, they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. When Ananias came to Saul of Tarsus, who had seen the Lord and had been blinded on the road and had gone three days of fasting and prayer, Ananias asked in Acts 22 verse 16, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, in the old King James Version, Peter says, Baptism doth also now save us. So as we're studying with individuals, and we're wanting to lead them to their salvation, that, that's why we would study with someone. We want to see souls being saved, and, and we'll look at verses like this, and, and perhaps they'll respond by saying, Well, I've been baptized. I've been baptized, so that takes care of that. We can put a check mark in that square, I've been baptized and so I'm okay. Well, we need to respond, have you been baptized the proper way? And have you been baptized for the proper reason? Most every church that I know of has some form of baptism as a part of their doctrine and a part of their practice, but yet there are many different views and many different beliefs, many different practices regarding baptism, and that makes a question like that, a follow-up question like that, necessary. Were you baptized the proper way? And were you baptized for the proper reason? The word must, M-U-S-T, indicates a requirement or a necessity. In order for baptism to accomplish what God intends for it to accomplish, Accomplished. And as we've read, baptism saves us. Baptism is for the remission of sins. Have your sins washed away. In order for baptism to accomplish that, then baptism has to meet the conditions that God has set forth. And these conditions, these requirements, are clearly set forth in the Word of God. So let's take a look at some of these this morning. We're going to look at what baptism is. We're going to look at five requirements or conditions for effective or scriptural baptism. Number one, baptism must be with water. Baptize is a verb. Even in the, the Greek language, the original language of the New Testament, it is a verb. There's an action there. The element with which the action takes place is not inherent with the word baptism. It has to be supplied by the context. And you may be surprised to learn that the Bible speaks of different kinds of baptisms. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, and this is Matthew's uh, account of what we were studying in the previous hour in Luke when John the Baptist was doing his preaching and talking about baptism and his baptism and the baptism of the one who would follow him. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit 
and fire. We've got three different baptisms mentioned just in this one verse. A baptism with the element of water. That was John's baptism. But then Jesus would come after and would baptize with the element of the Holy Spirit. And we read of that in Acts chapter 2. And baptize with fire. And I believe, as we, we discussed briefly in, in the class last week, I believe that's hell fire. Being plunged in the hell fire, I believe that that is judgment there. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 22 and 23, James and John come to Jesus and ask Him for positions of greatness in His kingdom. And Jesus responds to this by telling them they don't really understand what they're asking for. But He makes a point. Matthew chapter 20, and at verse 22, But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but the set on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Jesus brings up, challenging them, they've asked for a position of greatness, well, there are going to be some things that go along with this position of greatness that you're wanting, that you may not realize you're signing up for, are you going to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? And of course, like Peter, they say, well, of course, yes. They don't really understand what they're, what they're saying, what they're agreeing to, what they're signing up for. What were they agreeing to? What was this cup and what is this baptism? Well, in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 42... When Jesus is in anguish, praying to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that the suffering of the cross was about to be His to bear, in verse 42, Matthew 26, 42, again a second time He went away and prayed, saying, Oh my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. What was that cup? that Jesus had to drink, that He said James and John would have to drink, that was a cup of suffering. And I believe the baptism, going along with the cup, we're going to see in a moment that baptism, the action of baptism, is immersion. When Jesus went through His scourging and His death on the cross, He was immersed into suffering. So this, this baptism that Jesus speaks of to James and John in Matthew chapter 20, is a baptism of suffering. And then we have the baptism of Moses. Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and in verse 2, talking about the Exodus generation of Israel, how they went out through the Dead Sea, and on either side of them was water, and over the top of them was the cloud, which we know is, is evaporated water. And he says they were baptized in the Moses. That is, that entire nation of people we're all going through experiencing one thing that, that united them together, but they didn't all end up in the promised land. And that's the point that he's making to the, to the Corinthians there. They'd better watch out for their sin. Take heed lest they fall. The Bible mentions several different baptisms. Which one is it that Jesus says we have to do in order to be saved? Which one was it that, that the apostles commanded in order for us to be saved? The baptism that Jesus commanded for the remission of sins is a baptism with water. The text we had read for us just a few moments ago in Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 39, notice it has the eunuch hearing the gospel. Philip is preaching Jesus to him, and they go down the road, which means he continues to preach, and the eunuch said, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And he gets his confession, and he is baptized, and he goes on his way rejoicing. In Acts chapter 10, notice that water baptism was something that he learned as Jesus was being preached to him, as the gospel was being preached to him. In Acts chapter 10, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, and for the first time preaches the gospel to an uncircumcised Gentile. And the Holy Spirit falls upon Cornelius and his house as a sign 
to Peter and to these other Jewish Christians that, yes, these uncircumcised Gentiles are now candidates for the gospel. That's why the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and, and that convinced Peter, it finally got through to him, that they were candidates for the gospel. Verses 47 and 48, Can anyone forbid water? that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have, and He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. When we're talking about the baptism that results in our salvation, we're talking about water baptism. Have you been baptized with water? Seems like a silly question to ask to you perhaps, but if you're ever studying with someone who is from the Pentecostal, or a charismatic background, they're going to argue that this baptism is Holy Spirit baptism and not water baptism. So we need to go to passages like these two we have on our chart here to show that the baptism that was commanded for salvation is water baptism. But, but being even more specific than that, were you baptized in water? Not just baptized with water, but scriptural baptism is baptism that is done in water. Notice, remember again, in Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 39, they went down into the water, and they came up out of the water. Those are the actions that are taking place as the eunuch is baptized. I've heard it said by, by those who advocate sprinkling or pouring for baptism, and there are churches that practice that even today. They will sprinkle drops of water or pour water on the head of an infant and call that baptism. I've heard that some have made the argument, those who advocate that practice, that they have the, the eunuch as he's riding in that chariot with Philip as they're going down the road, that he holds up a canteen he holds up a flask and says, look, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? He's traveling all the way back to Ethiopia. He'd have some water with him. I, I'm confident of that. The problem is that they both go down into the water. And that doesn't happen with a bottle, with a flask, with a canteen. They had to go down into the water. And then they came up out of the water. If you didn't go down into the water... You weren't baptized the way the Bible tells you to be baptized. Look also uh, when Jesus was baptized in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. He came up out of the water. Even John's baptism, John chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, said that John was baptizing in a specific place because there was much water there. Baptism is not just with water. Bible baptism is in water. The action of baptism is submersion or immersion. It is it's translated from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dip or to plunge or to submerge. But you don't have to know the Greek to understand what the action of baptism is. You can go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 makes it very plain and very easy to understand. Remember again, Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him, and they came up out of the water. Keep that in mind. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, Paul writes and says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death, Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Scriptural, Bible, baptism is patterned after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. When we bury something, we don't take it into the backyard and sprinkle some dirt on it, and call that a burial and go on our way. Now when we bury something, we dig a hole in the ground, we put it down in the ground, and we cover it up. That is a burial. What is baptism? Baptism is a burial. We need enough water where a person can get down into it, 
can be fully immersed in it and come up out of it to walk in newness of life. So, when I ask, have you been baptized? I don't mean, have you had water applied to your head in an official church ceremony? I mean, have you been buried in water for the remission of your sins? That's one of the requirements of Bible baptism. But let's look at another one. Baptism must be preceded by repentance and confession. If baptism is essential for salvation, then why don't we just round up the masses and force them to be baptized, even at gunpoint? Make you kind of think of the Crusades and other things like that? No, no, that's not going to work. Why don't we baptize infants before they have an opportunity to choose not to be baptized? Why don't we baptize the dead? You've got a loved one, you've begged and begged to go to church. You've begged and begged them to, to become a Christian. They refuse to, they die. Well, before you bury that body, won't you just baptize them? Shouldn't that take care of it? No. Let's consider for a moment here who can be baptized. Who is a scriptural candidate for baptism? Number one, the Bible teaches that baptism must be preceded by repentance. In Acts chapter 2, we've quoted this verse. Let's turn and read it. Acts chapter 2, and at verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance must come before baptism. Even John the Baptist refused to baptize those who refused to repent. When the Pharisees came out to his baptism, he didn't baptize them, he told them to repent. You know, there have been times that I've not baptized individuals who've told me they want to be baptized, but I've studied with them, and we've looked, and, and they're in sin, and they refuse to repent of that sin. I've not baptized them. That's a judgment call that I made in that particular situation or those particular situations with those particular circumstances. But I believe, looking at the Scriptures, looking at the situation, I believe I made the right call. They weren't candidates for baptism at that point in time. Some more teaching needed to be done and fruits of repentance needed to be shown. Also, you cannot baptize one until they make a confession of their faith. What hinders me from being baptized, the eunuch asked. If you believe, you may. And he made a confession of faith, at, at which time the chariot was stopped, and they proceeded with the baptism. The only scriptural candidates for baptism are those who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who have given evidence that they have turned their lives away from sin, and are willing to confess openly that Jesus is the Son of God. Babies are baptized all the time in denominational churches, in the churches of men. This is a very important time in the life of a lot of people, a lot of sincere people. But babies cannot confess. And babies have no sin of which they need to repent. Babies are not scriptural candidates for baptism. When you say you've been baptized, do you mean your parents told you that you were baptized as an infant? I hope you can see that that's not what the Bible teaches regarding baptism. Uh, those who have not been taught cannot be baptized. That, that is, those who do not understand who Jesus is who don't understand what repentance is, who don't understand what baptism is, cannot scripturally be baptized. And of course, the dead are not scriptural candidates for baptism. Why would you even mention that? Because the Mormon church practices baptism by proxy. The Mormon church, before there were so many different online groups that got so good at genealogy, the Mormon church, really, were the experts at genealogy. 
And I understand the reason that they did this is so they could look back and they could find their ancestors, and if they weren't Mormons, then they would be baptized for their dead ancestors. The Scriptures don't allow that. The Scriptures don't teach that. Did you confess your faith in Christ? Did you repent of your sins before you were baptized? That's what we have in mind when we ask if you have been baptized. Next, baptism must be in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's turn to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, and we'll read verses 1 through 7. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. All this talk about water is making me thirsty. Here we have Paul embarking on his third missionary journey. On his second missionary journey, he took Aquila and, Pr Aquila and Priscilla from Corinth and took them to Ephesus and left them there. He did a little bit of preaching in Ephesus and then he hurried back to Jerusalem. In the meantime, Apollos is preaching the baptism of John and Aquila and Priscilla encounter him and they teach him the way of truth more accurately and he goes on to Corinth to preach the gospel there, does a good work there. Now Paul is arriving back in Ephesus. Look at chapter 19 verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We've not so much as heard, rather there is a Holy Spirit. Just pause right there. Paul realizes we've encountered a problem. we got some people here who are believers, but they don't even know about the Holy Spirit. So he does what anyone would do. He asks some questions. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Okay. That let Paul know what the problem was. These people need some more teaching. And so he sets forth to do that. Then Paul said to them, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance saying to the people that they should believe on Him who would come after Him, that is, on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. The reason Paul asked if they received the Holy Spirit is because that's one of the things that the apostles did. The apostles could give the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit when they laid their hands on believers. And so an apostle, when he encountered disciples, do you have the Holy Spirit? If not, let's see if the Holy Spirit has gifts for you. That was one of the jobs of, of an apostle. Well, he asked them about that. They don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. Hold on, we've got a problem here. They say we were baptized into John's baptism. Okay. That baptism served a purpose, but that purpose has been served, and now the Lord's baptism is in effect. And when they hear this, they are baptized in the name of the Lord. Being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus is not a formula that must be repeated in order for a baptism to be valid or effective. Again, if you're talking with oneness Pentecostals, they are adamant that you must be baptized in the name of the Lord. The baptismal formula, quote unquote, that is given in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, and at verse 19, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, they say that that is not the formula that needs to be said when one is being baptized. Matter of fact, in, in discussing this with some Pentecostals, they, they teach that you've got to learn who that is. Who is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, it's Jesus. They teach one as Pentecostals. So you have to be baptized in the Lord. And I said, well, you've turned the Great Commission into the Great Riddle. And they really didn't have a response to that. At least not the ones I was talking with. But they, they are hung up on this formula. You've got to say it right. In the name of the Lord Jesus simply is an appeal to His authority. Salvation was purchased, was made possible 
by Jesus Christ Himself. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 says that Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Jesus authored it. He wrote the rules. He's the one that offers it. If we're going to receive it, we must receive it on His terms. Not through any doctrine or any creed of men, any catechism given by any church, but by what Jesus sets forth, the conditions that Jesus sets forth. If you were not baptized the way Jesus says that we are to be baptized, that is with water, in water, upon the confession of your faith and the repentance of your sins, and for the right reason, you've not been baptized. What you need to do, you might say, well, I was baptized as an infant. I was baptized in this way or in that way. If it's not what you read of in the Scriptures, then you need to do what these Ephesians did right here. You need to be, what some could say, rebaptized. Into what were you baptized? John's baptism. They found out that that wasn't right, and so they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you realize that, that yes, you have undergone a baptism, but it's not what you read of in the Bible, then you need to be baptized for the Lord's baptism. That's exactly what I did. I'd been baptized into a denominational church, but when I studied with a friend of mine, and I saw Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, I knew I needed to be baptized for the right reason. And on August 4th, 1988, at about 11 o'clock at night, I was baptized in the name of the Lord for the remission of my sins. Maybe that's something that you need to consider today. Let's look at one more thing concerning baptism. Baptism must be for the right reason. The reason a person is baptized is extremely important. What is the purpose of baptism? If we stop some people and ask them that question, we're likely to get all kinds of different answers. Some say, well, baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. It's an outward profession or confession of our faith. It's a, a, a presentation of what's already happened in our hearts uh, when we accepted Jesus as our personal Savior. Or, baptism is what you do to join the church. You believe to get saved, you're baptized to join the church. You can get all kinds of different ideas about what the purpose of baptism is. Why don't we let the Bible answer this question? The Bible tells us exactly what baptism is for. In Acts chapter 2 and at verse 38, we've referenced this verse a couple of times already. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What is baptism for? The remission, the wiping away, the blotting out of our sins. In Acts chapter 22, and at verse 16, when Ananias comes to Saul, ask him, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. What is the purpose of baptism? Acts 22.16 answers that question, I believe better than any other verse in the Bible, to wash away those sins. That's the purpose of baptism. 1 Peter 3, verse 21, baptism doth also now save us. Mark 16 and verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's like a math problem. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. It's that simple. But the Lord puts salvation after baptism and not before baptism. And it's important that we see that, we understand that, and we respect that. How could one have been baptized? Let me ask this question. You're going to have to clear your head. But I want you to, want you to think about this. How could one be baptized for the remission of their sins? if they weren't baptized for the remission of their sins. Why were you baptized? Well, to join the church. Why were you baptized? Because that's what Jesus did. He was baptized and I should be baptized. 
Why were you baptized? An outward sign of an inward grace. If any of those is the answer, you weren't baptized for the remission of your sins. And if you weren't baptized for the remission of your sins, those sins are still there. Those sins are not God. So, baptism must be for the remission of sins. Baptism is important. And there are requirements to Bible baptism. Notice we haven't said anything about the location of your baptism. It doesn't matter if it's in running water or in a still, a still pool like a baptistry. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what day of the week you're baptized or what hour of the day. It doesn't even matter who baptizes you. The, the Bible doesn't say anything about these matters of baptism. But there are some matters that are very important. There are some matters that are essential. They are must. M-U-S-T. Must. When I ask you if you've been baptized, I mean, have you been immersed in water as a penitent believer in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins? If you have, then you can leave here this morning with confidence that your baptism is scriptural and your sins have been washed away. If you've never been baptized, then you need to do so today. I want to tell you, we have a full baptistry for a reason, because baptism is essential for salvation. And it's not something that we teach you all to do later on when we get it filled up someday. It's something you need to do now. And so we have the water ready. We have garments ready for you to change into. We have towels ready. I want to tell you, it will never be easier for you to be scripturally baptized than right now. It's ready. If you have been baptized, but you realize in our study this morning that it was not done scripturally, then you need to do just like these 12 in Acts chapter 19 did. You need to be baptized the right way for the right reason. Friends and brethren, we can't afford not to get this right. Because we're talking about the forgiveness of our sins. And we're talking about where we're going to spend eternity. And if you realize that baptism is one thing that is standing between you and those great blessings, then we're offering you and we're encouraging you to take care of that matter right now. Perhaps, perhaps you'll leave here today not having done anything, but you begin to have a doubt about your baptism. Take care of that doubt. You contact me. You contact somebody else here. And you let us know, hey, I believe I need to get baptized for the right reason. And we'll help you with that any time of the day. That's how important it is to you. That's how important it is to us. But if you know what you need to do right now, this invitation gives you the opportunity to do so. If you need to, please come as we stand and sing this invitation song.